All right, let's do it. Let's talk Jonte Porter and what is going on with the Toronto Raptors current player. He's away from the team right now because he's under investigation by the NBA following multiple instances of betting irregularities over the past several months. Uh, ESPN with that report late last night. So Jonte Porter, brother of Michael Porter Jr., got hurt a couple times, but has been playing with the Raptors this season. Not a ton. Uh, if you've watched any Raptors games as of late, there could be a guy or two you're like, who's that guy? Well, he's a Raptor right now. All right, so let's look at the two games in question, and then we'll run through all this. Uh, the first game is January 26th, where there was a lot of action on his unders, where the prop bets for Porter were five and a half points, four and a half rebounds, one and a half assists, and under basically half a three, so saying he's going to make zero threes. He played four minutes and left that game after reportedly re-aggravating an eye injury. He finished with zero points, three rebounds, one assist, and zero three-pointers made. Uh, the other game was on March 20th, where he had totals of the prop bets, at least, were seven and a half points over under, five and a half rebounds over under. He played three minutes. He left the game with, quote, an illness and didn't return. Finished with zero points, one field goal attempt, two rebounds. After both of those games, DraftKings reported on their daily activity that the Porter Unders were the biggest winners for any props in the NBA. <laughs> All right? So the January 26th game, where he re-aggravated his eye injury against the Clippers, the under three points made, that was the biggest winner for any prop. After the 320 game, the prop bets for Porter, the unders were the number one moneymaker for the night. So <laughs> the problem here is that Vegas and the people that handle the action, they are really smart people. They are not stupid people. And the problem for Porter is, is that you go, wait, a guy who 99% of NBA fans can't name, the only reason you'd be able to know who he was, you'd be like, oh, that's right, Michael Porter Jr.'s brother was pretty good at one point or whatever. But I just don't even know if one out of 100 NBA fans would know that Porter's on the Raptors that he was playing rotational minutes because the Raptors are tanking and they're completely off the radar. And then on top of it all, you're like, okay, like why, why would you do this if these allegations are true when you're a two-way player making $415,000 and potentially ruining your NBA career? Um, he sat out Monday after 26 games of the Raptors this season. I went back and watched the Clippers game on the 26th, and I watched the Sacramento game on March 20th. Uh, it was not hard to do to watch it this morning and watch the Porter minutes because there weren't many of them. So the problem is, is I'm watching them where I already know the story. So I'm watching Porter and looking for things that I think are painfully obvious. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know that they were. And I'm trying to be fair about it because as I'm watching it, I'm like, oh, what's going on there? And it's like, okay, but you would never be doing this. You would never be looking for it if you didn't already know that these two games specifically were the ones being investigated. Because against the Clippers, he's playing away from the rim. So he's going to want um, he's going to want to make sure that he's not getting a lot of rebounds. But it's like, okay, but wait a minute. That's not really fair because... He's in against Tice and matching Tice's minutes. And, and Tice plays on the perimeter, sends a bunch of screens, is more of a perimeter player. It's not like he's going to stand on the block the whole time and post up and then Porter's close to the rim to grab some of those rebounds. So as I watched it, I'm like, oh, maybe that was a one where he kicked it out. I think the most egregious thing from that Clippers game is that when Westbrook drives on him, Westbrook gets his arm into Porter's neck, and then Porter's looking to the bench as he's rubbing his eye. All right? That was the only thing I saw from the Clippers game where I went, okay, that looks a little weird. Was he already going, hey, the way to guarantee I win these? Because I can't make it look too bad. I mean, because there's other plays in both of these games where he's setting the screen, he's rolling hard, he's looking for the pass. Um, I'll get to the Sacramento game here in a second. Something funny in that one happened. But that he doesn't get hit in the eye by Westbrook 
And then he starts to rub his eye. And then he's looking back at the bench. And he still did stay in the game a little bit. So that one's the one that seems a little bit sketchy. But again, to my original point on it, I would have never noticed this. You would have never noticed any of this stuff unless you were looking for it after the ESPN report last night. Um, the Sacramento game, this is weird because he comes in and he's got two rebounds immediately, <laughs> like 17 seconds in. <laughs> and then I noticed that when Toronto lines up for an opposing free throw, Porter was on the lane, and then randomly he wasn't, and then he was on the lane again. So I was like, why would he ever, when he's in there for the backup five minutes, why would he ever not be lined up for free throws? And then he wasn't. And then there's a play at the end of the quarter where you know, he was on way too high of a rebound pace because the first 17 seconds he's playing in that game, it was just the ball went right to him and he had to grab the rebounds. Again, if any of this is true, but then there's a moment where the clock is about to expire for the quarter, but the ball is heading to him and he's got the rebound, but he kind of fumbles it towards Schroeder, which doesn't make any sense. The clock goes off, so that one may not even have been logged, and then he leaves that game with an illness. The most damning part is that Vegas got a ton of action on the unders from a player almost nobody fucking knows, and he left both games. So if you're watching this stuff and going, ooh, that was a weird screen, or that's weird, or how come he didn't help here, or why didn't he do that? The basketball stuff, you would never, ever be watching this. I don't care who you are. You would never be watching that going, hey, something's up. It's that he left the games and there was action on it. I saw a bunch of theories, uh, whether it was Porter, I mean, the Otani stuff. I didn't really know what to say because I was like, this just doesn't make a lot of sense. With Otani, I have more questions and I have answers. The language barrier adds to all of it as well. We were just like, wait, at best, Otani's like a good friend who paid his buddy's gambling debts. And in the middle, it's that Otani had four and a half million stolen from him. And at worst, it's basically what any baseball fan is arguing on social media that hates the Dodgers. Because that would be like really unfair because it doesn't really make any sense. Like I saw something with Porter where it was arguing that he was sharing these because I guess he's kind of like into crypto and it's trading and it shared some of this stuff. And guys are digging through it all, trying to find like the thing, the clue after the story comes out. And it's like, man, all I can, all I've learned from you is that, you know, you would be awful at lost and found. You'd be like, oh, found him. You'd be like, no, it's a treat. Like there's just People want to be so involved in it after the fact to uncover like the next piece that maybe makes them get a ton of attention. Uh, and that's where I don't think you're going to find the basketball stuff other than the painfully obvious, like, wait, they got all this action randomly from all these people wanting to see what they could bet on the unders, and he left both of these games. So that leads perfectly into the next part of this. Um, I've seen a lot of this and a lot of it is, well, hey, everybody's talking about gambling now. It's legal in a bunch of states. Your favorite network is doing it. It's in the arena. The leagues have gotten into bed with them. And this podcast, we're giving out a four-leg parlay a little bit later today. And that because of the heightened awareness and maybe just the removal of the stigma of it, that we're going to see more and more of this stuff, even going back to Calvin Ridley. Uh, I can't tell you that you're wrong, right? I can't tell you that you're wrong because, you know, the whole point of getting the word out is to try to get more and more people to do something that is just a lot of fun for some. And in this case, career threatening, if you're actually an athlete playing in one of these leagues, knowing that you're doing something you can't do. So I'm sure some could listen to this and say about me, well, you're just saying that because of this. And I'm like, look, if you know me, if you listen to me, granted, we have more and more new listeners all the time. I'm pretty straightforward with this stuff in that, yeah, there's way more gambling content right now. Never seen anything like it. But the sprint to blame everybody else other than the person who's the one who ultimately fucks up the most it consistently fascinates me. I thought about this when I was reading about the story. You ever go to some tourist attraction somewhere where it's like a huge cliff? 
It's a waterfall. Like it's something that's really dangerous. And everybody gets that it's dangerous, but it's awesome to look at. So they want to give you some access, but they can't give you all the access because there's always somebody pushing it. And there'll be a sign that's like, don't jump into this canyon. And most of us read that sign and we go, who the fuck is that sign for? Who looks at this and goes, hmm. And it's not the sign for the rest of us. It's the sign for the person that just is like, well, there's no sign. So maybe I'll do this. Or more importantly, the sign is for the person that if there were no sign and they jumped and got hurt, they'd be like, well, there wasn't a sign. (laughs) You're like, well, so what's that mean? Like imagine going to the zoo and jumping in the bear cage, getting attacked, living And then blaming the zoo, you're like, well, I didn't see a sign that said I shouldn't go into the bear cage because I'd like to think most people understand the difference without having to be instructed all of the time. I've seen just even looking at some of the reaction on TV today from the story. It's like, hey, man, NBA has a huge problem. Same thing with Calvin Ridley. Like there's certain media guys that I'd be like, oh, the NFL takes all this gambling money. But then Calvin Ridley I'm like, yeah. You're right. The same reason Pete Rose is still signing fucking autographs across the street in Cooperstown. So I can't tell anybody that feels that way that you're wrong, but I'm just not going to feel bad when the next player screws up. And I think another thing to add to it is that Just because guys are getting caught now, does it mean they're getting caught now because guys are just starting to do it because gambling is at the forefront of content more? Or is it that now it's just way easier to get caught because of the tracking capabilities where in the past all sorts of stuff happened that we'll never know about? 